Hello, my name is Mr. Anderson, and I am mean to people on the internet. I'm always very polite about it, though. I just tend to ask just difficult questions and insist on the answers. Now, one of the cool things about, you know, doing debates and preparing for them uh, is that uh, you get to learn about new things. And uh, another cool thing about doing it in the context of a debate is that it gives you a reason to learn those new things and it motivates you to learn those new things. And so I do encourage people to you know, go out there and debate about stuff um, because you go and you, you learn about those things um, and you want to know more. And even when you get to you know, what might otherwise be considered boring parts, it gets exciting because you're looking for that fact and you're going, I got you, right? And you, you think about these things and you think about them from with a critical eye. Um, and one of the things that, uh, uh, or, and something that brought that home to me uh, recently was uh, a debate review that I did recently with uh, a friend of the channel um, and actual friend named uh, Atheist Jr., uh, who has an excellent channel of his own, uh, and you should go check it out, and I'll link it in the description. Um, and he just uh, debated our, uh, our friend Kent Hovind um, on the subject of embryology. And... Uh, uh, we had the opportunity during the, uh, uh, during the context of our debate review to talk to a PhD embryo or not embryologist, PhD evolutionary biologist who teaches this stuff to university students for a living um, and we got to chat to him about this subject and gave us a great cra uh, crash course on embryology and why it matters from the perspective of proving evolution, why it is good evidence for evolution, and why the arguments with respect to intelligent design and creationism when it comes to the evidence for embryology just fall flat. And so that's what I'm sharing with you guys today. I literally talked about this in class today. And like, like one of the things we do is we talk about um, development in birds and we compare it to development in mammals. And the funny thing is that, you know, bird development, the way that embryo is shaped as it develops is that like it is a very specific morphology because it's basically a flat disc because it has that giant mass of yolk. You know, think about a chicken egg, right? Like that yolk doesn't divide. The cells are just this little bit that sits on top of that. And then you look at a mammalian embryo. And the weird thing is a mammalian embryo doesn't have any yolk. We don't need it because we develop in utero. We have a placenta. We get our nutrients from, from the mom, right? But the embryo looks like a bird embryo. It doesn't look like a, you know, a starfish embryo or something else that doesn't have any yolk. It looks like a bird embryo. It's this flat kind of structure. And then it does the same kind of cell migration to get your three basic germ layers. Why does it look like that? Why does it look the same as a bird embryo, but different from a starfish? Because we share a more recent common ancestor. And that common ancestor had this big, massive yolk for a self-contained egg, right? Like, like the point of using development as evidence for evolution is that you see similarities that only make sense in the context of a hierarchy of increasingly recent common ancestry. Right. And you can go through monotone. these traits and identify them little bit by little bit. That's like the big thing. And Ken just doesn't understand that, right? So like, you know, to some degree you yeah, have this debate, the, you're talking to a brick wall. Yeah, the thing yeah. that like, I mean, I, I thought um, was kind of missed was that like, it's you can explain the the similarities between the different embryos in terms of common design when we're talking about the common structures, right? Like, oh, like these embryos look similar, you know, in terms of like when they're growing a backbone because like both of them have backbones. So those are going to look similar. And, you know, uh, they are both have skulls because both of them are going to have skulls. And so those things are going to look similar. And it's like, oh, that's fine, right? But the problem is, okay, but then why is it that we both have I'm going to call them gill slits because it's just easier for me to call them gill slits. They both have, okay, pharyngeal arch arches, right? Gill slits. Why do you, they both yeah. have gill slits. And the thing is, and you sort of said this, AG, but I didn't, I don't think it registered for him, uh, was that they're not just folds of skin, right? Like they're, and and Dan, you, you can you can correct me on this, but my understanding, or, or AJ, because you know. No, AJ nailed it. AJ had it. They're, he nailed it. Like, like they're, they're way more than folds of skin and they have like all of this, mm -hmm. they've got the cartilage and then they've got the blood supply and they've got these different things. And those things look very similar to the way that gills work in a fish. Like those are all the base structures for, that's why we call them gill slits and not human slits is because they look like fish gills. Like they don't change, you know, fundamentally 
in the fish. They do in the humans. They become something like totally different. They take a left turn. But it's actually they your, your, your parathyroid. It's your parathyroid is what it becomes. Yeah, it becomes this like that. way it's different thing. We literally thing. learned that this week. It's it becomes those time. those bits of tissue become the parathyroid in in terrestrial vertebrates. In, well, in couldn't you go into the, the argument then maybe like or, well if it if it was common design why did it have to be designed in such a way that all these different structures come from this specific embryonic stage of that development? That was the okay. argument. Yeah, why, that why was, that was the, that? yeah, that was the knife. That was the knife twist, but. I mean, we're pick we're picking, uh, you know, the like, or, you know, the nits out of like a beautiful, like, you know, we're we're looking at like tiny, tiny, like, you know, whorls in the thread of a beautiful cloak here. Let's be let's be fair to to AJ, right? Like, no, you I did think a, AJ did an it. amazing job, and you did have that information yeah. there. Um, like, you know, so it was it was it was glorious, right? The uh, the thing with the common design argument is that it only works for things that have a function, and once you get into the realm whether you're talking genetics or morphology or anything once you start talking about things that don't have a function it falls apart right so why does a mammalian embryo or why do any vertebrate embryos doesn't have to be a mammal have a notochord none of us have notochords as adults we replace it with vertebrae why right. is that thing there why does a mammalian embryo have a yolk i don't know what a notochord is oh, i sorry. thought it was a notochord so so, so chordates, like the group that we're a member of, chordates, there's four like defining morphological traits. You have a postanal tail, right? You have a tail that extends past your butt. You have uh, pharyngeal pouches, arches, whatever you want to call them. You have those folds in your neck embryonically. You have a spinal cord. The technical way to say it is a dorsal hollow nerve cord, but spinal cord. And then you have a notochord, which is a flexible rod of cartilage. It's a support structure that runs down your back below your spine. So if you have the, the skin of your back, and then you've got your spinal cord, and then below that, you have this thing called a notochord. Now, the only vertebrates that have a notochord as adults are, are sorry, the only chordates that have a notochord as adults are invertebrates vertebrates replace the notochord it goes away and it gets replaced with vertebrae segmented backbone in an adult why do i as an embryo have a notochord that functional like the common designer argument doesn't work there because that only works for functional things right that's a prediction you can make and it's all about predictions is common designer same function same structure common designer same function same genes whatever medium you want to look at right what about non-functional things? Why do mammals develop a notochord embryonically? Why do fish develop a notochord embryonically? It doesn't exist as an adult. Why do uh, apes develop a tail embryonically? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have a function as an adult. It goes away embryonically. Why, why do whales why it, start why, to why develop nimbus and then they go away? Right? These snakes. are predictions from evolution that don't make sense, that are explicitly not predictions of the common designer argument. On, on his thing with the pythons and their little hind legs. Oh, they need them for mating. What about all the other snakes that don't have those? How do they make little baby right. snakes? Yeah. <laughs> well, the other thing, and, and I don't know if um, if Joel Duff is still in the chat, um, but uh, he has put out a couple of videos recently about um, uh, tails and teeth, uh, uh, like the tails of mammals and, or tails and apes and teeth and chickens. And I was like, oh, that that's that's a cool that's a cool line of argument, right? Like this notion that uh, that we have so we have tails as embryos and then they go away, but the genes for those tails don't go away and they're actually still in our genome. And if uh, if we're designed and uh, you know. Uh, and, and any difference between what we are now and what we were when we were created is as a result of degeneration. And that would suggest that as, as that Adam and Eve had tails. It's the same thing with snakes. Like right. snakes have the pseudogenes for legs, but they're not, they're not like activated. They have genes for legs, but they're not turned on. Right, yeah, right. you can look at genetic level. I think someone mentioned uh, yolk sacs earlier. Uh, we have the same genes. Uh, for from producing yolk, and I think monotremes have at least one of the genes for that. But so 
it's a very small yolk sac. Uh, but like, what? Why are those genes still around? Why are they pseudo genes? Yeah. Did you the guys same notice thing with, uh, teeth on uh, on on birds, right? And birds have the genes right. for teeth. They can make teeth. We know that because yeah. we flipped them on, and had birds or, or like baleen whales developing miniature teeth in, in their gum sockets before they develop baleen as adults. Like, what? Why are all these stages still present if they were designed for for that purpose? And, and not just why are they present. But specifically, they are present in the pattern common ancestry right. predicts them to be present in, right. right? Like you don't see, for example, you don't see like insects with genes associated with vertebrae or a bony endoskeleton, right? right. You don't see chordates with genes for a chitinous exoskeleton, even though you would, you know, mostly consider like insects you know more primitive right in the kind of naive view compared to vertebrates so you would maybe think oh well maybe those older genes are still present but they're not no it's because it's a pattern of divergence from each other and a nested hierarchy and what you're looking at are what is present in the common ancestor not as what's present in the you know the simpler things well, well, it's, well dan exactly have you the considered the platypus sorry say that again I said, but Dan, have you considered the platypus? You know, I I have actually. I have right. actually considered the platypus. <laughs> I've, I've heard of this animal. Tell me more about it. <laughs> I do this. Like, here's. I love the. I. I love when creatures like. Well, have you thought of like, my friends? I do this for a living. Yes, I've <laughs> thought of that. Like, yeah. Sorry, it's just always amusing when whenever you ask or when, whenever we ask for. Uh, a chimera organism like that that breaks the nested hierarchy they always go to the platypus and virtually nothing else as far as i can tell but like here's the thing with that and everybody should know this the platypus is basically a perfect example of what we would expect as something that ha that is ancestral that has traits that are more ancestral that are closer to like our common ancestor with reptiles but is partially along the line right. to mammals right so a platypus is an endotherm it has fur it has mammary glands it doesn't have nipples it still lays eggs it has an amniotic egg like reptiles it's like this wonderful you know people hate the phrase like living fossil but it is like a living transition between a reptile-like common ancestor and more derived mammals. And like, I just- And as venom. I, I just ask creationists like, learn one thing, pick and one thing. I don't care what it is, but pick something and please learn it. And then stop making that bad argument. And there you have it, my friends. So those were Atheist Jr. and Dr. Dan Stern Cardinal, also known as Creation Myths on his channel, Creation Myths. Um, both of whom are amazing people and whom you should go and subscribe to right away. And you should probably also subscribe to me because everybody loves me. I'm very nice. Anyways, you guys, uh, I hope you enjoyed this installment of, I don't know what we'll call it, um, learning about stuff. Uh, and uh, have a great day.